Hello, my name is Nick Huntington Klein. Uh, we are finally on to chapter seven of my book, The Effect. Uh, and in this video, we're gonna be talking about how to draw our own causal diagram. So in the previous videos, I talked about causal diagrams. And causal diagrams are a way of representing what we think we know about the world in a diagram and talking about the causal relationships between those variables. And when we do this, where it's gonna give us a, a little bit of a hands-on approach to figuring out what we think the data generating process looks like and in helping us figure out how to identify our causal effect of interest, which after all is what we are here to do. Um, so, but in order to be able to actually make any sort of use of this, we have to be able to not just be handed a causal diagram, because uh, how often is that going to happen? We need to be able to understand how to draw our own. So how can we do that? Now remember, our goal here is to represent what we think the data generating process looks like. We observe some data about some relationship that we are interested in. Perhaps we wanna know the effect of some treatment on some outcome variable. Uh, and we wanna think about, well, why might we see those variables in certain ways, right? Why might we see that they tend to move together or apart or together sometimes and apart other times or whatever it is, right? What is the set of underlying laws that led there to be a relationship or not? Uh, and what kind of relationship and how strong? So that's going to be our goal. And we can do this with a couple of basic steps. I mean, mechanically, there's not a whole lot to do here. All we have to do is think about the list of variables that we think are relevant to our data generating process. That is, what measurements or variables, uh, uh, concepts might there be in the world that would explain why we would see the data that we would see. Some of these might be measured variables that we can get a handle on. Some of them might be more abstract concepts that we maybe can't get a measurement on, but we still would want to think about why, how that might generate our data. Then once we have our list of variables, we just need to think about what are the causal relationships between them. We have our list of variables, and we want to know which ones of them cause which others. And that's the step at which we're going to be bringing in a lot of our prior knowledge. It's pretty much impossible to draw much of a causal diagram if you're going in and not willing to make any sort of assumptions or rest on any sort of knowledge that you already have. Uh, we're going to be relying on things that we have learned from prior research or just things that we happen to know about how the world works in order to draw out our causal diagram so that we can learn a little bit more. Remember, you can't really learn much more without making some assumptions about what you already know and are willing to stake your foot on. So we're going to be listing our variables and we're going to be thinking about the arrows between them. Let's do an example. Let's walk through creating our own causal diagram. Uh, so I'm going to take an example from a study that uh, I worked on myself. Uh, and in this study, we were interested in the effect of taking online courses on your chances of staying in college. You know, if you are pushed into, if you if you go, if you attend an online course, does that maybe change uh, uh, how much you learn in the course, or maybe change your affiliation with the college, or something else that might make you more likely to stay in school as opposed to drop out? So we want to come up with a list of variables that might be relevant to explaining this relationship. So obviously we have two variables to start with. We have to start with uh, what kind of class we're taking, was it online or not, right? Because we're interested in that, that our treatment variable, we want to know what the effect of taking an online course as opposed to a face-to-face -face course was. And then we also have the outcome variable. Uh, we have to know, well, did you stay in school or not? That's the thing that we are interested in seeing the impact of online classes on. So those are going to be our first two places to start. And when thinking about expanding it further, we want to think, well, what are all the things that might go into seeing um, these variables, right? What's going to, what are variables that help determine the values of these two variables, right? What are some causes of them? Those are the ones that we really want to focus on. Anything that is, uh, that causes these two variables of interest are going to be really important to include. We might include some other stuff as well, um, but those are the ones that we really want to pay attention to. So let's think carefully about what some things are that are responsible for seeing the data that we see. What might drive someone to take an online course versus a face-to-face -face course? What might drive somebody to stay in school versus not? So we might come up with a long list of things, maybe uh, your, your preferences uh, for what kind of education you like. We might not be able to measure that, but that's probably going to be relevant. Somebody who really likes the idea of an online course is going to be more likely to take one. Uh, even if we can't necessarily measure that preference in their heads, we know that it's going to be important. So it would still go on our causal diagram. Uh, those preferences might be related to all sorts of background factors, maybe uh, your preferences uh, change based on your age or race or gender or what have you, all sorts of demographic characteristics, your socioeconomic status. Uh, all those things are probably going to be related in some way also to your chances of dropping out of school for one reason or another. Uh, plenty of other stuff that might impact uh, where these two variables came from, things that might cause 
uh, are variables of interest. Uh, anything that determines how much how, how much freedom you have in your schedule, uh, that can be relevant. Uh, so, you know, schedule freedom, maybe that should go on there, but also anything that's indicative of that, something we can measure your schedule freedom with. So maybe um, how much available time you have or, or your work hour. Somebody who works all day might be more likely to take an online course because face-to-face -face courses tend to take, to take uh, place during the day when you might be at work. Uh, other things like do you have access to the internet that might impact whether you take an online course uh, or not lots of other things and you can probably keep imagining things that might go on this list but it's a good exercise to walk through where you think these things might come from uh, and of course you know we don't want to put the entire world on here uh, you could map this all the way out for everything and you know have a diagram that tries to represent the entirety of all the education system and why stop there all of society but no you want to keep it a little bit more simple focus on the things that are really related to the the causal relationship that you are trying to explain i want to know the impact of taking an online course on staying in school so i'm going to focus on things that are related closely to those two variables it's really important uh, that we have, especially any variables that are related to both of them, uh, anything that happens to be related to both your tendency to take an online course and whether you stay in school, like let's say your work hours, right? Somebody who's really working a lot at their job might be more likely to want to take an online course so it doesn't interfere with their job, but they might also be more likely to drop out if they decide that it's just too much time for them to stay in school or uh, perhaps they got a promotion at work and they no longer need the college education that they were working for right? These two things are related, so we want to be absolutely sure that we include them. Also really important to include is anything that is that causes the treatment that we are interested in. A lot of causal inference is going to come down, in, and how well we can do it, is going to come down to how well we understand why some people got different levels of the treatment, right? And that's going to be key to doing a lot of the methods that we're going to talk about in the rest of these videos. Can we understand why you got treated? Because the thing that makes causal inference difficult is often that we might not understand entirely why some people got treated and some people didn't. And the less that we know about that, uh, the more sort of backdoor uh, shenanigans that are going to mess us up and get, get us away from our causal identification, we're going to invite in. We don't want that. So the more we understand about where treatment came from, what are the causal determinants of our treatment, the better a job we're going to do at identifying the effect that we want. So we want to be really sure that we have things that determine both the treatment and the outcome. And then we really just in general, really, really want to know about anything that is related to the treatment itself, because that's going to be really important. There's other stuff too, um, but that's what we want to really focus on. We also want to make sure that we're really including stuff that's important, right? You know, you, just because something could be potentially maybe weirdly relevant in some weird corner case doesn't necessarily mean that it needs to go on the diagram. In fact, you can get into a lot of trouble by just adding literally everything you can imagine. These are the social sciences. The list of things that might be kind of relevant a little bit is basically infinite. Uh, you don't want to fall into the trap of doing that. If something is only going to have likely a very, very minor, minor effect or relationship, you can probably get away with leaving it out. So for example, we're talking about online courses uh, and uh, staying in school. One thing that might affect whether you take an online course or not is whether you happen to live kind of near to a quiet cafe, right? Uh, so if there's a nice quiet cafe that you can take your online course at, well, maybe that might make a couple people more likely to take the online course, but probably isn't going to be a big determining factor for a lot of people. So even though probably it is related to taking an online course for a small number of people, you can also probably get away with leaving that one off of the diagram, keeping things a little bit simple. Once you have your list of variables, you then want to think about the relationships between them. Based on your knowledge of the world, based on previous research that you may be familiar with, which of these variables cause which other variables? And then we can draw arrows from one to the other. And you wanna think through this for all the different pairs of variables that you might have. Do you think that one causes the other? Why do you think that? Uh, which direction should the arrow go? And all that sort of stuff. So uh, we can go through one by one. So for example, if we're worried about the things that might cause somebody to drop out, well, in our list of variables, pretty much everything is probably related to uh, dropping out or not, right? Your, uh, all those demographic background characteristics are gonna be at least related to dropping out. The, the rates of dropout are probably different across those different uh, variables, not, not necessarily the case that those things cause dropout, but they're related in some way, and so we might have a pathway between them somehow, uh, which we might shorthand by saying one causes the other. Uh, there might be some things that only cause online classes. So for example, whether you have good access to the internet or not is probably going to have a pretty direct relationship or effect on whether you take an online course. If you have bad internet, you're not going to want to take an online course. Uh, but it's probably not going to have that much of a direct effect on whether you drop out or not, right? Uh, 
Beyond thinking about things that might cause the treatment or the outcome, you also do want to keep in mind that these things could cause each other. They don't necessarily just have to be caused as of the treatment or the outcome. Uh, so for example, uh, something like socioeconomic status, that is probably going to have a causal effect on your preferences, right? The way that you were raised, the, the economic background that you had probably shaped the preferences that you might have around taking an online course or not. Uh, and also it probably uh, uh, is also causal related to a bunch of other stuff, right? Your socioeconomic background is going to affect the kind of internet access that you have. If you grow up with a lot of money, then there's probably a good chance that you have a decent internet connection available to you. Uh, if you didn't, it's going to be a lot harder for you to get to that point where you maybe could take an online course and have the internet available to do that. So you want to think about all those relationships as well. Now we could go one by one through every single pair of uh, variables. I do that in the chapter. Um, but uh, in general, that's, that's the step that you want to take. You want to think carefully about what the relationships are between these. And it could come from your understanding of the world, a the theoretical understanding that you have about how things fit together. You know, the, the explanation that I just gave about how socioeconomic status probably causes internet access, that is a theory that I have about the world. Uh, I've just sort of had that theory on my own, but you could also almost certainly look for some research that would back that up. And probably if you're going to do the best job that you can of this, you're going to do that. You're going to find sources and evidence uh, and previous studies that show that a particular arrow from one variable to another is going to be there or not. And then you can build on that. We're always standing on the shoulders of giants here. So going through all those steps, here is what we end up with. And it is an absolute mess. Uh, and this is a common thing, especially when you're starting out uh, with drawing a causal diagram. You know, again, this is the social sciences, everything is related to everything else. So it's not a huge surprise that we have a long list of variables and a lot of arrows just sort of ping-ponging back and forth, as well as a number of unobserved things that I haven't even labeled, U1, U2, U3, U4, U5, that just explain variables being related to each other, even if neither necessarily causes the other. So for example, we have a U5 sitting, uh, sitting there and causing both socioeconomic status and location, uh, even though we wouldn't really say that your socioeconomic status causes your location, or we wouldn't say that your, that your location causes your socioeconomic status, at least maybe not strongly, we're not willing to make that case. We just say that they're related to each other, and so we have give them some sort of common cause. You could maybe draw it a little bit differently. Maybe you would say that socioeconomic status causes location, right? Thinking through what your theory is is going to impact how you would draw your causal diagram. Uh, and so it's, that's why it's a really good idea to go on those prior sources for, these, for this stuff, um, which might help us all get a bit more on the same page if we're basing our arrows on evidence and not just sort of making them up. But regardless of that, we have a mess here. Uh, there's not going to be a whole lot that we're going to be able to do with that. And so uh, the next step after we've drawn our causal diagram is to try to think, how can we simplify this into something that's going to actually be useful without simplifying it too far as to make it wrong? And that's what we're going to talk about in our next video. Thank you. Thank <music> you.